Southern California. This is Revolution. And this is titled, If Parasites Had Wings. The factor that enabled SARS COVID-2 to spread from China to the rest of the world was global transportation. This is, indeed, the sin qua non of a pandemic. A spillover event alone is not sufficient. There must be a grid through which the pulse can propagate. If a hunter from an uncontacted tribe gets infected by something and dies in his sleep, that's the end of his story. It follows that the early modern history of infectious disease is written in the ink of merchant capital, specializing in buying cheap goods in faraway locations and traversing the globe to sell them dearly. In Contagion, How Commerce Has Spread Disease, Mark Harrison chronicles the epidemics recorded in the ledgers of trade, starting with the Black Death a pest bacterium jumping from marmots to rats and then abroad the ships of uh, Genos merchants collecting Chinese silks and spices in Levantine ports. When those traders set foot in Sicily in October 1347, the plague arrived in Europe. That is from Andres Malm. In his book, Corona War Communism in the 21st Century. I'm sorry, Corona Climate Chronic Emergency War Communism in the 21st Century. Andres Mom is a scholar of human ecology teaching at Lund University. He also is the author of The Progress of This Storm and Fossil Capital, uh, which won the Isaac and Tamara Dusher Memorial Prize. I finally had the privilege of speaking with uh, Andres recently, um, and it was it was a great conversation. I he he gets into his solution, his idea that he kind of is 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 spitting out in this book. He calls it ecological Leninism, right? So we get into that and a little bit more. Uh, in our discussion, uh, one that it took about a year to happen because he went on family leave, which I, he was kind of apologetic. And I was like, no, 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 I'm quite jealous that, uh, you know, where you're from, <laughs> you can take a year off and go be dad. That's fucking rad. So I was like, don't be sorry. I'm, I'm quite jealous, but. Uh, I've, I've talked about this book quite a bit. Um, Mike Davis, who, who also has been on the podcast, actually has a blurb on the back where he says, uh, forcefully unmask the assumption that economic growth has inevitably brought us to the brink of a hothouse earth. And that's a lot what this is about, right? Like, we can't talk about climate without talking about capitalism. So, I'm not going to waste too much of your time, and we're just going to get right into it. Here is my discussion with Andres Mom, author of Corona Climate, Chronic Emergency, War, Communism in the 21st Century. Also, if you are a patron, you don't have to just hear us babble. You can see us babble. Uh, there's video up of us talking. That's only going to be for patrons. Um, also, I can't stress it enough. If you haven't done it, there's links in the description to this show. If you have done it, thank you oh so much. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we do live streams every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, we've been flirting with Monday, but those three days for sure. And they've been growing. The community's been growing. The patron community is growing to the point where we're going to add a new feature 
uh, just for patrons. Uh, th there's been some very hilarious suggestions. So become a patron and send a suggestion of what you want us to do for, for patrons only. There's a, there, we're talking about watching a movie, but what we watch and how we watch, you know, I'm trying to get some sort of uh, group think, some democracy in here of what, what people would like. And there's been some really hilarious suggestions. But I will shut up now. And here is my conversation with Andres Mom, once again, author of Corona Climate, Chronic Emergency, War Communism in the 21st Century. All right. All right. I'm just going to jump right into this. Uh, I am here with a gentleman that I've been wanting to speak to for the better part of a year. The schedule is finally freed up. Uh, I had to contact the publisher. <laughs> I'm here with Andres Mom, and he wrote a book. Uh, came out uh, right around the time of the lockdown, called "Corona Climate, Chronic Emergency, War Communism in the 21st Century." Um, I saw this as an advertisement on social media. So you know how social media gives you these advertisements that tells you what to buy. <laughs> I guess I was making good choices at the time, and this book came up. It, it wasn't even out yet. It was like a pre-order. I saw it, and I was like, oh, this looks interesting. And I opened it, and unlike a lot of books I read of this scholarly ilk, there's an introduction. They have to thank everybody. There's all this flowery shit. And then you get into the actual work, about 30 minutes of reading. No. You don't fuck around with anything. You're like, I got some say, and I'm going to say this shit. This felt like you wrote this out very angrily. <laughs> I was on the lockdown. How could I not be? <laughs> I, I I read this. I was like, man. And and so my girlfriend actually works in uh, pharmaceutical research. Um, as I close the doors, we we have our conversation. She's having a a different conversation about uh, new upcoming medications for the masses. Um, once I got this book, she grabbed it and she started flipping through. She goes, "Ooh, wow! I want to check this out." So, what hurt my feelings the most about this book is you don't get enough love. <laughs> When I when I mention your name in certain circles, I would I did an interview with uh, with a, a gentleman. I don't know if you know him. His name is Dr. Michael Harris. Uh, he's got a couple books out on zero books. Yeah. Uh, he he wrote a book about uh, Star Wars that, of course, you wouldn't know because you've never seen goddamn Star Wars. <laughs> uh, One of my many gaps, Sam. Well, that like I said, when the world opens back up, if even if I have to go to your hood. Cause I got to go do some touring over there anyway. I'm like, we're going to come on. We're going to the theater, grab them badass kids. Let's go. Um, even even he was like, oh, I love I love mom's work. I was like, really? He's like, oh, love it. So I rip into this book, and it starts off with wildfires in Australia, which I actually had forgotten about. And then goes into locusts devastating the Horn of Africa. And kind of then we get into to China. Um, I saw an interview with you recently where you were, were, you were talking about climate change. And I really liked your take on climate and corona and kind of capitalism. I am an anti-capitalist. Anyone that's listened to the show knows this is a very anti-capitalist uh, uh, show. Um, can you talk a little bit about that that uh, that correlation between the, the the wildfires and the locusts, and and even where we are, uh, you know, with the, the the markets, the wet markets in China? Well, first of all, it's 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 not strange that you had forgotten about the the wildfire inferno in Australia. I can't keep track of all these disasters either. I mean, they come so thick and fast that it's it's hard to keep them in mind. Uh, and is there a link between them, or are we, are we just having this sense of being completely overwhelmed by one 
cataclysm after another. Well, it, with, with the relation between the pandemic and global heating, there are different sorts of links. So one link is that deforestation, uh, which is the second major driver of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, mm. is uh, the central cause of what we're seeing, namely uh, a tendency for more infectious diseases to jump from wild animals to human populations. Because when you cut down forests and or you intersect them with roads and you, you build mines inside forests and things like that, you... Uh, come into contact with uh, wild animals that carry these pathogens with them naturally. Mm. <clears throat> uh, and o- obviously, when you cut down forests, you also release the carbon that they have sequestered, and it goes into the atmosphere, and, uh, and it hits up. So that's one link. Another link is that when uh, temperatures rise, animals start to migrate and move to track their, the climate that they are adapted to. And therefore, you have a kind of chaos in, in, in animal populations where they try to uh, find the climate envelope, uh, mm-hmm. which is now on the move. So they, they, they're moving, tend to move northwards as the temp- temperatures rise. So uh, some animals like bats that, that carry the coronaviruses, and uh, this, uh, this coronavirus, by all indications, came from bats in, in China. Bats are on the move. They're they're traveling northwards, away from their usual habitats when temperatures rise. Uh, so it's quite likely that we'll see more of 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 these spillover incidents when animals uh, try to adapt to rising temperatures. And the, the science, is, is, as far as I've read it, is pretty clear on this: that with a warming climate, we'll see more infectious diseases of this kind. So that's another link. I, I mean, there are many links of this kind. So. Uh, I think uh, one of the remarkable things about the past year is, at least where I live in Northern Europe, the ecological dimensions of this pandemic are almost completely forgotten. And no one really discusses what is causing this. One would think that after a year like this, mm-hmm. uh, people would, would, would ask, how do we make sure that this, this doesn't happen again? How do we avoid another pandemic of this kind? But there's there's almost no discussion about that. Everything is about... When will, will, will we get vaccinated? Yeah. Uh, who, who are we going to prioritize? What kind of restrictions should we have in place? What things should be closed down and what, what things not? All about treating the symptom, but almost nothing about going after the driver. Which which means that we, we're likely condemned to have more of this shit. In the well, well, that, and, that's what, and that's what I found interesting about your book, because uh, when it came out, we're very far away from from vaccine at that point when they came out. I want to say like April or so, April or yeah. so of last year. Well, no, well, I, I wrote the book in April. It came out, I think, in September. Is it September came out? No. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, yeah. anyway I don't remember exactly when, right? Because days become years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the in the age of lockdown. Yeah. Um. And I remember talking to my my girlfriend who i said you know works in in, in uh, pharmaceutical research yeah. and she was very skeptical of of a lot of these vaccines because actually her job is to organize the studies yeah. um of, of dr- upcoming drugs yeah. and she, you know her take was that a lot of times these come you know it's not like they're sitting in a laboratory like people probably think you know oh we got to get to work yeah. She goes more often than not. There's there's things that never went to market that might work, and a lot of that is rolled out with some changes here and there. But uh, it takes years for these things to be tested and approved to make sure they work. And and one of the big uh, flaws with a lot of the vaccines, or that or not flaws, but uh, critiques that I had was that the companies that were making them were deciding what was effective or not, right? Mm. You know, if you have 105 temperature, now it's down to 102. It works. Mm, mm. It's effective. Mm. And the news was literally reading like press releases from Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and Johnson as far as how effective these things were. You know, nothing was peer reviewed, <laughs> which which is kind of frightening. So again, back back to your to your book. Um, I think it's important for us to kind of discuss how these things happen because i think for a lot of americans 
I don't know what the climate is where you are. It felt like people just wanted to blame it on wild bats in, in China. And a lot of this book is, is blaming it on the consumption that we have through the systems that we live in as, as capitalism. And um, I've never seen that discussed anywhere when we talk about coronavirus. And when you were, you know, we talk about, you know, burning forests in Australia, like that doesn't happen in a vacuum. No, sure. And I saw an interview that you were in and you were like, you know, if we just didn't eat meat from South America for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? The, the deforestation in the Amazon and, and our consumption of, of meat down there. Yeah, I mean, this is, the situation in Brazil is pretty terrible in lots of respects. Not right now. I mean, I mean, I read a news article this morning about the fears that because the Bolsonaro regime in, in Brazil is is doing so little to combat the virus, it has essentially free run to mutate and and develop into even more lethal variants that will, of course, spread far from Brazil. Uh, but I mean, what's happened in Brazil is that you you have this far right government, the equivalent of the Trump government, that has just given a free reign to ranchers and others to cut down and burn as much of the rainforest as they like. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they transform what what uh, until recently was luxurious rainforest into patches of land for commodity production. So ranches for cattle or various types of plantations. And uh, the commodities that are produced there are very largely exported. So sold to markets in Europe or in the US or in Japan or other affluent places. And there are supply chains that run from advanced capitalist countries deep into the Amazon uh, pulling up the forest and, uh, I mean, transforming the forest into those commodities that are then uh, sent out on the world market. And, of course, making a few people immensely rich, those that, that sit on the top of those supply chains and that reap the profits from all of this. So uh, what, what Bolsonaro has been doing is that he's been essentially handing over the Amazon forest to global capital as represented on the ground by these ranchers with guns. And... Uh, uh, of course, that, that means running roughshod over the, the Afro-Brazilian communities, the, the Quilombos, and the indigenous populations in, in the Amazon. Uh, we, we, I have another book. I should, I should say that both of these two books that, that I've written recently, I, I wrote the Corona book, then I wrote a book about tactics in the climate movement. These are not based on any primary research that I've, I've done. So the whole thing about the relation between capitalism and COVID, there are others who've studied this much more than, than I have, notably a guy called Rob Wallace, but Mike Davis as well. As, uh, yeah. yeah this. He was talking about this one in 2003. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I have a book coming out based with, on a lot of primary research done with, with other comrades in the Zetkin Collective. It's a book called White Skin, Black Fuel on the Danger of Fossil Fascism, where we deal... Uh, uh, quite extensively with the situation in Brazil and how uh, how destructive it has been to the forests. And uh, this means that that destruction, uh, of course, alters the... the uh, well, it impacts the climate. Mm -hmm. And it also uh, creates so many new spawning grounds for zoonotic spillover. For, because, I mean... It, this rainforest holds an abundance of bat species and pathogens of all sorts. And when you tear it apart, these pathogens come flying your way. So I'm sure, I'm sure there will be uh, uh, infectious diseases jumping out of the Amazon in the near future. Well, there already was an outbreak not long ago. There was, there was a new Ebola outbreak in, in, in Guinea, uh, yeah. Yeah, in, in West yeah. Africa, just the other way. So this is not a Chinese thing. It's about constant expansion of capitalist commodity production in tropical rainforests all over and, the world. So the, the, next, you, the next pandemic can come anywhere. You, you write in your book, the pathogens would not come leaping towards us. 
they would be secure among their natural hosts. But when those hosts are cornered, stressed, expelled, and killed, they have two options, go extinct or jump. In this now must-read spillover animal infections in the next human pandemic, published in 2012, David Quammen likens the effect to the demolition of a warehouse. When the trees fall and the, na- and the uh, native animals are slaughtered, the native germs fly like dust from under the bulldozers. The science is agreed. The secular trend has a very general driver in the economy advancing from the human side all over the wild. Another turn to the non-human world is, after this, a must. And, and he begins with the, I'm just going to say, the, the chiro, chiroperta. Am I saying it right? Chiroperta? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, that, you know, that, that's, that's exactly what you're talking about. And um, you have a whole short chapter here uh, of bats and capitalists. <laughs> Unlike the uh, best folks. That, that, uh, that, I, that I really liked. And you talk, and you know, people don't understand. I, I, I think, again, like when they want to make it a China problem, like it's, it's native to China. Yeah. But as you explain in your book, and then, you know, numerous people have said about bats in general. It's not like bats just live in China. They kind of live all over, right? They migrate yeah. thousands of miles. Yeah. Um, and the wet markets don't help as China has opened up their world market, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you and you cite that that has a lot to do with. So, do you look at China as a state-run capitalism, or do you see it as as this is some manifestation of their version of of what they call it socialism with Chinese characteristics? No, I don't, I don't see any socialism going on there, except for uh, some ornamentation. But I'm I'm not an expert on China by any means. I haven't visited the country. I don't speak the language. I don't I don't know China very well. But mm-hmm. my my impression is that China is a place where the contradictions of contemporary capitalism are crystallized or intensified uh, at a you know at a at a higher degree than almost anywhere else. Uh, this this goes for the exploitation of workers and factories. It goes for the transformation of, of the land and the uh, the insane construction boom that they've been having, the problems of, of over accumulation, over production, over capacity that they're struggling with and have been for a long time. And I think it goes for the uh, situation with the, with wildlife as well. Of course, of course I mean... I'm not saying that that cultural norms or local concrete culinary uh, traditions play no role, but it's it's false to attribute this this destructive relation to wildlife to any innate Chinese uh, tendency because it's rather something uh, that has been has exploded in China as it has opened up to to uh, global capitalism and as a certain segment of the Chinese population, the, the, the very richest have uh, uh, begun to flaunt their wealth and uh, uh, engaged in a conspicuous consumption of wildlife as a way to show off. And that's what rich people do all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's the U.S. as well with uh, with all the tigers and, and, and everything. <laughs> yeah. Did you fall down a? Re- did, did, do you have a Netflix where you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you watch the Tiger King? Of course. Did it? Did it? Did you? Do you and your family go? You know, that's America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not not the entirety of it, but when we watch it, we we feel uh, like what's wrong with this country, but. Uh, I mean, you can say the same thing about China. I mean, I've I've watched some YouTube episodes of, of you know, entrepreneurs who get rich by by uh, eating and selling various type of uh, of wild animals. So yeah. it's a it's a global phenomenon. That's the point, isn't it? Th- that that is that is interesting that you that you tie it into Tiger King because that has a lot to you know what is it? There's more tigers in the U.S. than in the wild. Yeah, exactly. In, in their in their native lands. Um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, global markets opening up and really, really rich people wanting a goddamn tiger, um, which is silly to me. Um, 
I don't even want a Doberman Pinscher more or less than a goddamn tiger. Uh, <laughs> and and it's interesting because I I, I believe it's in here. I, I I went back and started to reread the book. I, I like I said I tore into it when I first got it. Um, airplane travel. Yeah. You know, Dr. Lori Garrett talks about that a lot. Definitely helps these things spread at a ridiculously rapid rate. Like before someone even knows they're infected, you can infect um, a plane full of people and, you know, know, probably tens of thousands of people in an airport before you even know what's going on. Um, That kind of scared me a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's why the, the, the planes are still grounded, most of them, I guess, at least, I mean. You would think, man, there's still people that want to fly places. I know, I, you know, I don't know if you saw this, but there's two states here in the U.S. as we as we record this this show, there's two states here in the U.S. that have decided to open up fully. Uh huh. Texas, Texas, which uh, you probably could imagine. Yeah. And uh, and Mississippi. And Mississippi. They're gonna have bars open, concert venues open, schools. I guess I guess the businesses get to have a, a mandate if they choose, you know, kind of like a business says no shoes, no service. Now they can say, well, we're open, but we'd rather you have a mask. We're going to have, you know, they, they they can still set their own mandate, but it's not being um, set at a at a state government, and definitely the federal level is is lacking in the U.S. Mm-hmm. In the title of the book, you say war communism in the twenty first century, and constantly. And especially in the first half of the book, you're comparing uh, state leaders fighting the war on the virus, but no one wanted to fight the war on climate. Mm. And I love the way you you say, well, well, the reason why people say that is because well, we can't fight a climate war. It's invisible. It'll cost too much money. We can't afford to do yada yada yada. And you know, within within a few scary deaths, all of a sudden schools shut down, yeah. planes are grounded, yeah. essential workers only. And and definitely my country didn't handle it as well as, you know, places like China, Vietnam, mm-hmm. New Zealand. Um what is your what is your take on on the government uh the majority of states western states handling of covid compared to climate yeah i mean i think it would be hard to sustain that myth for much longer that we can't disrupt our economies to protect the climate because clearly we can disrupt the economies to protect populations from out of control infections uh, so uh, it's not that states cannot close down certain industries force certain uh, businesses to close clearly the state can do that if it if it can muster the will the question is uh, why doesn't it muster the will to close down fossil fuel companies to begin with uh, and uh, I, I think it's quite plain that one of the reasons is that those companies are so extremely powerful. I mean, uh, I mean, you can t- you can take France, where the single largest private company is Total, uh, one of the big oil and gas companies in the world that is in no way closing down. It's expanding. It's it's planning to go into the Arctic to drill for more oil and gas with the backing of the French president Macron. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Total should be the, the, the first in line uh, among companies to be uh, closed down. I mean, it shouldn't it shouldn't take up any more oil and gas. It should uh, switch to producing only renewable energy and and maybe take CO two down from the atmosphere instead of pumping more out of it uh, from from under the ground. Uh, but but that's not happening, uh, and that's not it, it's not happening because it's impossible for states to intervene in our economies. It's it's not happening for totally other reasons. For because the 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 state in France, as in all our countries, is completely beholden to capital and serves its interests. 
does it i i heard Giannis Varoufakis talking uh today and he was basically talking about that there is socialism for these these major fossil fuel companies yeah like like they can get all kind of you know uh federal subsidies uh permissions to you know drill in places like the arctic yeah um why are we afraid of any sort of green new deal yeah that's a good what, why why is that Even bill gates bill gates is extremely afraid of it i mean he, I, I don't know what's what's it's like in the u.s but he's all over the place in sweden right now with his new book it's it's crazy the amount of propaganda that that comes from this book uh, <laughs> yeah but he you know he says that the green new deal is as uh, i don't i don't quote him verbatim here but roughly it's as nuts as uh, the anti-vaxxers uh, hostility to vaccination yeah i mean he's scared to death by the idea that that you can have a green new deal that would actually shift power in society from capital to labor while transitioning away from fossil fuels of course that scares him to death so therefore he has this book out that that pretends that we can solve this without making any encroachment on private property we we just have all these technical fixes all these gadgets that will solve this problem without any politics in it, without any need to challenge any vested interests or tinker with property relations or anything. And and that's, I think, what's so appealing with his message to a lot of people, the idea that, oh, we can can solve this climate problem. Even the richest guy in the world, or maybe now it's the second richest or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. He has a plan for how we're going to to solve this so we can all relax and sit back and enjoy our our life i mean that that appeals to uh, a certain type of middle class uh, reading audience uh, and it, a I certain think bourgeoisie it, sensibility yes and i think it, it kind of soothes people people's climate anxiety that, oh i mean we don't have any influence over uh, we don't run society but this rich guy he has a plan for how we're going to avoid climate disaster and let's trust him that's that's kind of frightening don't you think? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Yes. Um, and also, you know, when you have that level of money and power, you also have a lot of uh, leeway when it comes to writing policy. Yeah. Um, he's definitely changed the education system here in the States. Um, not for the better. Um, definitely has done some serious damage in India <laughs> as far as how you know, between seeds and some sort of intellectual property rights with seeds and kind of, kind of frightening. Um, but it, it, he is an interesting character as well because the, the QAnon crowd, I, I don't yeah, know if that's a thing where you, is that a thing where you are? It is a thing. Uh, it's definitely a thing in Europe. I don't know how big it is in Sweden. I, I, I'm not up to speed with conspiracy theories in, in Sweden, but it's certainly a thing in Europe for sure. Is it really? Yeah. It's massive in Germany. Really? Yeah, well, you know, Germany and other countries in Europe have had these anti-lockdown protests uh, from the far right. Mm. And the far right has had this uh, opportunity to capitalize on people's uh, discomfort and frustration with living under lockdown. And so and that's, uh, I mean, it's this cesspool of conspiracy theories about everything from Jews to Muslims being behind the, the virus, uh, and, or Bill Gates, for that matter. Oh, Gates, yeah. yeah, and and you have Q Q Q A non in that uh, in that mix for sure. That's that's disgusting. That is literally disgusting. Um. So the 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 one thing I did want to ask you about, and I, and I, and I've seen you in some interviews talking about this, and and I'm not going to. I saw you in, in a mildly antagonistic interview recently <laughs> or someone was messing with you about this. I found this very interesting. Your war communism. So basically, what do you call it? Eco, eco-leninism? Yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> all the all this nice and sweet terms. Yeah. <laughs> eco-leninism to fight... Uh, coronaviruses um <laughs> you 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 uh you you mentioned something really interesting about planning an economy about how how kind of easier it is than people make it out to be 
Yeah. Um, did you want to explain that a little bit? Uh, your and I, and I know you said that you just you use the term as kind of like a like this this will get your attention. This you know eco Leninism. Leninism. Sorry, I said it wrong. Yeah, I'm 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 actually pleased to say that I, I'm far from the only one right now thinking about what Leninism might mean or what it could inspire in, in this moment. There are others who, who, who do it as well, and there will be collective conversations uh, emerging and developing on this topic. And the reason, I think, is that we find ourselves precisely in a, in a, in a moment of, of catastrophes, and that's exactly the moment when Leninist politics uh, became meaningful. So in the time of the First World War, which was really the, the original catastrophe of the 20th century. Now, this, this moment of catastrophe so far looks very different. It's not armies sending millions of people to slaughter themselves in trenches. It's uh, ruling classes who uh, set the planet on fire uh, by, yeah, by burning fossil fuels and by letting the, the destruction of the natural world proceed and, and, and produce uh, pandemics. Uh, and uh, the, the very basic and simple and, in a sense, I think, uncontroversial idea at the core of what I, what I call in this book Ecological Leninism, and I have to say that I wrote this book very quickly, so it's a very rough and crude sketch. It's, it's not by any means a finished program or anything like that. But the core of it is just this idea that if, if you're in a catastrophe of this kind, you need to turn it around and go after the drivers, the causes of the catastrophe, or else it will just continue. So what Lenin said in the moment of the, of the First World War, and so did Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and others in the socialist movement who opposed the war, is that the ruling classes are keeping the war going against the interests of the working class who, who dies, literally. So... If we want to stop the war, we have to depose the ruling class and uh, replace that class with our class and, and, and our power. And that's what they did in Russia and eventually in Germany as well for a very brief moment, at least. And that's how the war end, came to an end, essentially. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and of course, the, the, the failure of the German Revolution uh, uh, made... I mean, predisposed Germany to a second war, but we, let's not go into the historical. Yeah, we're not going to go into that. Yeah, yeah no. But the the point when you try to apply this to the present is, and here's the uncontroversial thing: if we don't turn these moments of outbreak of a pandemic or of a climate disaster, I mean the the, hur the, the hurricanes, the wildfires, or anything, if we don't turn this into crisis for the drivers of the problem. Fossil fuel combustion in particular, because that's what drives global heating, then we're doomed to just having more and more of these disasters and they will escalate and intensify and eventually become unbearable. So the strategic task for the left is exactly the task that faced Lenin and his generation, namely to transform the catastrophe into a more or less revolutionary crisis for uh, for the drivers of the problem and it, yeah that's that's really what we have to do i don't see i don't see what the alternative would be and you're also talking about like the famine that happened right was it right after the war the yeah. first war there was a famine so it was like a world war then a famine and a civil war yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember the timeline yeah and epidemics i mean they had they had the spanish flu in, in uh, oh god yeah <laughs> 50, 50 million, million people, people. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So here we are in the new COVID economy, and there's still a war against labor. Um, and, and as you said earlier, I want to bring it back to something you said earlier about um, people like Bill Gates not wanting a Green New Deal because it's putting power back into the hands of labor. Here in, in my state of California, uh, we recently had a bill pass uh, called Proposition 22 which was really a kind of a, a war on on labor with the gig economy. I'm sure you have uh, Uber and Lyft where you are. It was basically a, a proposition that went against an assembly bill that we had here in the state of California that called the, the people that work for a lot of these gig companies employees. So they were uh, deemed to have certain rights as employees and not the, the non-rights as contractors. And Uber and Lyft 
put about, I think it was $200 million into an ad campaign to fight um, this, this, uh, this assembly measure. And the assembly measure actually had a caveat that said, hey, you can have all these workers' rights, but you can't unionize. So the assembly measure still had some flaws. So this new proposition that uh, that these gig economy companies write up, and that they're testing it in California, right, to see if it works, it ends up passing. The first thing that they do is uh, one of the larger uh, grocery store chains here in Southern California um, fired all of their union delivery drivers and replaced them with gig yeah. drivers. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very similar here, although uh, I mean the, the the situation on the labor market in Sweden and the the, the degree of, of unionization is I mean it's a different universe from the U.S. Still, I think something like sixty five percent of the Swedish labor force is still in unions. Uh, Jesus, a couple of decades ago it was eighty five or ninety percent, so it's dropping very very fast, and that's partly because of the expansion of sectors like the gig economy. But here you you just we just had the first. Uh, collective bargaining um, agreement made between Fedora. I don't know if, if is that a company that that's active in in the US market. Do they the... make hats? No, no, no. They they have all these people running around on bicycles. Uh... Oh yes, okay. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know if it's here, but I know now. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's mostly people of color, and they're exploded like hell, and they are sweated and stressed and you know, all of it. And now, for, for the first time, there is an uh, agreement between the union and the company, which improves some of the conditions for those workers. But it's a massive problem. And it's it, once again, it's, I mean, all of these problems are global now. Mm -hmm. they're, they're totally globalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's part of the, of the new... If, uh, I mean, the process of atomizing and decomposing the working class uh, by throwing people into those works that have so little stability and solidity and that are hard to unionize and organize. Uh, but but uh, there are signs clearly that it's possible. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert in this field at all, but uh, but it's, it presents a lot of challenges for building working class politics that 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 large parts of the of, of the of the contemporary working class has to live under these conditions do you think the le the, the left now and again I, and i'm speaking from my lens in the states and the, and the little bit that i've that i've traveled from from touring as a musician yeah. um do you think that we're a little divorced from working class politics yeah for sure for sure uh yeah that's a massive problem i mean it's it's uh, it's a massive problem in so many senses uh, if if i should speak about my own country sweden that that that's been a, a country where the working class has been tied in loyalty to the social democratic to, to the socialist parties the social democrats and the left party for longer than almost anywhere, but in the in the most recent election, uh, the Swedish working class for the first time voted more for right wing bourgeois parties than for the left. So there is that massive uh, break in the historical tie between the working class and its political representatives, and that that's what something you've seen all over Europe. Clearly, the history here is very different from from uh, from the U.S. But here we've had this tradition of socialist parties representing the working class, but they don't anymore. And one uh, way that that manifests itself is that you have segments of the white working class in our countries drifting towards the far right, and this you can see in in Sweden, and it's it's absolutely disastrous, uh, obviously. Uh, so we have we have a very nasty far right people that that came out of the Nazi neo Nazi skinhead movement in the nineties that will most likely be in the in the government after the next election and they have a considerable support from from uh, segments of the white working class in this country and uh, uh, it's 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 very complicated the situation the the relation between the left and the working class in a country like my own uh, uh, and it comes down a lot to race and to uh 
how the left has lost certain um, sections of of, uh, of the white male working class, in particular, to the far right. Uh, and it's very complicated. It's uh, it, why, it, why do you, so now you do have a large immigrant population or growing immigrant yeah. population, yeah. and they're coming from West Africa. Well, there are some from West Africa, but not that many. Uh, from Africa, the, the the main community would be the Somali community, but otherwise, it, it's primarily the Middle East. It's primarily the Middle East, and and there's a lot of just straight up racism because now there's a new class of of uh, of uh, uh, disposable labor, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, hyper segregated cities and uh, and all of these things, yeah. And and why do you think what brings about this in, in, in the world that we look to, you know, Sweden, there's people like, you know, some of our elected officials always point to, yes. to the Scandinavian countries as yeah. they're just doing it right and everybody's getting along. And, you know, you're, you, you hugged five black people today before you sat down and talked to me. So <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what is <laughs> What is the real reality of 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 your uh, yeah? It, I, I is it have kind of scary to talk it, about. Yeah, it's it's been a strange experience in recent years to encounter this uh, enormous infatuation with Sweden, in particular, and Scandinavia in general, from from the U.S. left. I mean, from from Jacobin and people people around that that magazine, that project. They are really looking up to Sweden historically, but also still now as a kind of model society and that just feels extremely strange i i am aware of course that that the welfare state here mm -hmm. uh what was and what remains of it is uh largely positive well, well it is a positive thing uh but I, I mean the levels of inequality in this country the the insane levels of racism uh and the uh, the uselessness of much of the established left of, of social democracy, uh, which is, I mean, social democracy here is like Hillary Clinton or something like that. It's uh, oh wow, that's that's kind of gross. It is, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I'm yeah, it's, I, I sometimes feel, I sometimes feel almost like a uh, like a peasant in China in the nineteen seventies. Receiving all the those Maoists uh, who come to 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 look on them if you've, as you're having a model society with with all differences, of course, it's not like we're living under that sort of tyranny. But it's that that outside uh, glorification or idolization of what people would like to be a model society that they can point to as as uh, as here. Look here, Sweden and and Scandinavia. That's the alternative. They have welfare. They have uh, equality. Well, unfortunately, it's not the case. I mean, we had some of that in the 1970s, but it, it it had problems back then as well. Nowadays, there's very little of it left. I mean, we, where I live, we have cops right now uh, trying to crack down on any uh, illegal immigrant that they can find. I mean, the, the amount of racial profiling that's going on right there where we live is just totally insane. Now, isn't there, and I and please correct me if I'm wrong, some of these immigrants aren't able to ex access some of the the benefits, right? Sure. I, I mean the well, the the supposedly illegal immigrants, so people who are not who who are in Sweden but don't have uh, residence residence rights, are of course being chased and have to live underground. And when they when they are found by the police, they get locked up and deported to Afghanistan or or Iran or wherever they come from. So no, of course they completely shut out shut shut out from from uh, from the welfare system. And, and it, like it is here, where if you are there illegally, now if I'm a capitalist, I have a whole new labor force that I don't have to obey any laws. Uh, uh, uh. I was giving you benefits and leave and whatever else. Uh. That's out the damn window. Uh. Uh. It's the same thing. Yes. Uh, and uh, But it, this is also contradictory. Uh, but yeah, yes, certainly you see similar tendencies here with where these people are uh, susceptible to being hyper-exploited. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
so it does it feel like and and I feel like that's what it is here you have a certain percentage of the native population that is afraid of of immigrants not really understanding why immigrants are there you know everyone believes yeah. the lie that their country is the best yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Totally. they they you know they just want to come here cuz we got all this free stuff yeah. that's what people say about america keep that in mind people say that about america yeah we don't even have free shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh sure uh, i i can only imagine what they say where where you're from yeah. and yeah. and and it feels like the people that actually own industry don't really care about that fight because they look at it like, look, I have a new workforce that I don't have to pay as much and I can make way more money. Yeah, but the, the problem here is also that you see a kind of realignment in the ruling class that looks a little bit like just before and under Trump, where the, the, the traditional bourgeois parties are causing, causing up to the, really far right so there is that i mean the 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 the, the business community the uh, the intellectual and political representatives of the capitalist class in sweden are preparing an alliance with the fascists who want to 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 stop all immigration and start kicking people out on a massive mm-hmm. scale so it's not like uh, capitalists in Sweden or elsewhere are working hard to open borders and receive the immigrants that they can exploit. Rather, they're, they're defending their political hegemony by uh, uh, teaming up with the far right. Mm. That, sounds, that sounds scary. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you're like yeah that's <laughs> pretty frightening i mean you just got rid of 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 trump which is a huge relief from i mean from from a swedish horizon it's i mean it's a psychological relief not to see him in the news every day anymore he's still but in the news i i know i know he's he's reappearing and, and all these things but there 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 are far-right forces in europe that are rallying their troops and that are uh, you know looking at becoming the next presidents and the next prime ministers in many countries. I mean, you have that in France, you have it in Finland, you have it in in Italy, you have it in this country and elsewhere. So it's not like because Trump is gone, we are done with the far right. It will haunt us in the next few years and it, it, will, it, will, it will play out in Europe to a large extent, I'm afraid. Real, real quick, and this is, I'm just asking your opinion. You know, I know you don't have the concrete answer. How do we fight this sort of xenophobic rise of the far right? Yeah, that's that's the big question. Uh, <laughs> I wish I wish I had a ready-made answer to. Uh, I mean, no, I know you don't. Let, just riff. Yeah. This is this is me and you, just two yeah, guys yeah, yeah, yeah. in a room talking. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I've I've been involved in, in anti-fascist and anti-racist uh, stuff in, in, in Sweden for about 25 years. And the far right that we have tried to fight has only grown stronger and stronger, election after election. So, I mean, everything we've tried so far has failed. And how do we beat them? Well, I, I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, but I think that uh, the ecological crisis will become the more and more will become the uh, determining situation or battlefield. Uh, and uh, uh, when climate impacts bite harder than they have so far, uh, the struggle against the far right will largely take place in that context more and more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, the book that I mentioned that that's coming out in a couple of months is all about what this future might it might entail, what what this future, how this future has been prepared over the past years and decades, and and what's coming. And you see, uh, I mean, we in that book we speculate about different scenarios, and and you, you we see different dangers. One of them being, of course, that uh, the far right in a world that is is struggling with with the. Uh, ecosystems that are breaking down the far right will try to defend existing privileges as aggressively as possible and keep people out and uh, tie the hostility to immigration 
to uh, a situation of uh, what is at least perceived as scarcities and shortages and, and things like that. Uh, and of course, this is frightening to think about. Uh, and I, but I, I think that one of the key questions here would be to try to align the ecological struggle with the anti-racist one and, uh, uh, and bang on about the total... Um, impossibility for any solution to the ecological crisis to emerge from the right, and in particular from the far right, and say that, I mean, try to try to make it clear to people that if we are going to, to really deal with this deepening ecological crisis, we'll have to, to fight completely different problems than what the far right wants to fight. Because the far right, in, in Europe, it's all about immigration as the big danger. But immigration is not the big danger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the big day, the big apocalypse is a completely different one. And it's it's uh, global heating and it's all the pandemics and all of these symptoms of the ecological crisis. And this this kind of choice of problem has been defining for European politics and I, partly, I guess, for American politics as well for for some years. And it will be so even more in the in the in the years ahead. And uh, uh, clearly, the the left has a strong case to make, and one that should appeal to a lot of people, and that is that unless we uh, forget about immigration, because it it really isn't a problem, uh, unless we shift our focus to the ecological crisis and what's driving it, we'll just, uh, I mean, we'll eventually all get caught up in the flames. Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, that would be the rational thing to do, but the far right. Is not rational and it, it thrives on uh, drives and interests and, and emotions that are not necessarily rational either, which makes the struggle very difficult. And capitalism is never part of the discussion, right? Like even here, when we talk about immigration, we never talk about um, it, it's never it's never a conversation that's had in context. You know, we have a lot of people from Central America coming up here, but that has a lot to do with dirty wars this country fought <laughs> you know over there in the 80s um you have a lot of immigration where you are that has a lot to do with you know devastating wars that are being fought in these people's country climate change because of you know these wars and also and, and you talk about it a little uh, in the book of course but the global north we've been exploiting the resources in the global south no for some time now yeah. destroying these environments of course grounding them to powder so of course these people if they survive are going to, to leave you know there's literally it was a jakarta moved their capital because it's sinking yeah. <laughs> you know these are real problems that are facing an actual population of people that's pretty much just forgotten i feel yeah. like Sure. So when we talk about immigration, even on a global level, I feel like people look at it like, well, we don't have space or we don't have resources or, you know, we just need more walls. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it seems like that's the language of the far right. So, that, you know, I don't, I don't know. Far right. Unfortunately, it's also the language of the center in Europe. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. You're talking about like Merkel and. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, the European Union is doing everything to protect its its external border against people who are not white coming from Africa or, or the Middle East and uh, and they are dying in droves in the in the Mediterranean yeah uh, with the with the boat sinking and all of this um, and it's not only the organized explicit far right for sure that is to blame for this uh, the far right is the kind of pathological normality of European politics. It's a good one. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's so one. your your new book, the title sounds like you got it from Fanon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a riff of it. Yeah, another riff of from Fanon. Yeah. Another. So you're you're a fan of Fanon. Yeah, of course. You have to be. You say, of course. Like I know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Fanon is popping in 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 uh, Sweden. No, I mean you have to be a uh, sort of you belong to the lunatic left to <laughs> it, but if if you're there, yeah, for sure you have to love Fanon, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and when is this book going to drop? May. Is it going to be on Verso as well? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is 
my conversation with Andra Small, uh, who has a book out currently, Corona, Climate, Chronic Emergency, War, Communism in the 21st Century on Verso Books. I will definitely have a link in the description of this show uh, to get this book. I suggest you get it. It's like 200 fiery pages. A man wrote this book in, a, in an angry haze, and uh, I love it. I love every bit of it. And if you don't believe me, uh, Mike Davis has a blurb on the back. Uh, oh, here it is. Forcefully unmasks the assumption that economic growth has inevitably brought us to the brink of a hot house earth. There you go. What more is there to say? You have anything to say on the way out, Mr. Mom? It was a real pleasure to, to speak to you, Jason. Hey, thank you. Hopefully you can come back. Yeah, I'll right, see you in I'm real stop. life some point in real in real life once this yeah. is all over jesus so i'm gonna stop recording don't hang up